Years back, there was a famous Olympic swimmer who was expected to sweep all the events that he entered. And it turned out that he did not get the gold medal for the first event. And the commentators were all saying, well, it looks like that's it for him. He's going to just go into a tailspin. And his coach said, you don't know this swimmer. And sure enough, he came back and won all the remaining events. He had the ability to not let his failures get in the way of making a success the next time around. And this is an important principle that we need to hold to as we meditate, because we're going to make mistakes. You make up the mind to stay with the breath. Think of the whole body breathing in, the whole body breathing out, and then asking yourself what kind of breathing feels good in that whole body context. And pretty soon you find yourself someplace else. So you come back. Actually, you don't have to come back. You're here. It's just that you drop whatever thought it was that distracted you. And the breath is right there. And you stay with the breath a couple more times, and then you're off someplace else again. Well, you come back again. The important thing is not to give up. The second important thing, of course, is to learn from your mistakes. Sometimes it takes a while to figure out exactly what you're doing wrong, why you can't maintain mindfulness for more than a few minutes. But if you're on the alert for the fact that things will happen and you're not scared by them, then you can notice, oh, the mind does this. Sometimes it'll sneak in a separate agenda. It does this in kind of an underhanded way. And it lies there in wait, and then when you're the least bit oblivious, then it comes in, takes over. So you have to watch out for those warning signals that something's up. Or when the mind gives a few signs that it's beginning to lose interest in the breath. It hasn't dropped the breath yet, but it's just not interested in it anymore. Watch out, it's ready to go. And it probably has another landing place planned. So watch for the warning signs. Expect that the mind will leave the breath. In the same way that when you're dealing with other issues in the meditation, you can expect that there are going to be problems, and you're not going to do it right the first time around. But that doesn't mean that you're not going to do it right at all. It simply means there's new things to learn. Don't be afraid of learning new things. And that means not being afraid of making mistakes, but being very willing to learn from them. Remind yourself that we all come from ignorance. This is why we're suffering, and this is why we have to meditate. Unfortunately, we've got good teachings. A teaching of an awakened one to guide us as we go through the meditation. And we've got the example of all the great Ajahns, all the great other meditators who've gone before us. They showed that it can be done. Sometimes you read in the biographies of the great Ajahns, it sounds like they were destined without any question to gain awakening. Which is one of the reasons why I like a John Lee's autobiography. He points out that there were times when he had doubts, times when he was weak, when he made mistakes. But he learned from those mistakes. That's the example to be taken. And remember that everybody has to go through bad patches. Think about the Buddha. You can think of his six years of austerity as one huge bad patch. He was convinced that he was going to squeeze awakening out of his mind, just as he squeezed any desire of pleasure out of his mind, by punishing himself. And then finally, after six years, he came to a sense that this was not working. 
Well, he didn't give up. He just asked himself, is there another way? This is the way he acted throughout his quest for awakening. He'd catch himself doing something and notice the results that were coming from it, and ask himself, are these the results I want? If not, look, turn around and look at what, I have to look what I'm doing, see if there's something else I can change. There has to be a certain amount of good humor that lies behind all this, and that you can laugh in a good-natured way about your mistakes, and then move on, learn from them, and move on. But it's always important that you keep your spirits up and not get discouraged. Remember the example of all the, the nuns and the monks and the Terigata and the Teragata who are getting pretty suicidal, and then they realized that what they were doing was stupid, and they were able to turn themselves around. And John Fuhrman talks about when he was young. He looked at himself. His parents had died when he was young. He had nobody to create connections for them in, in Thailand. And connections are everything in the society. He wasn't doing well in school. He'd been taken to a, a monastery where the abbot was a doctor, and the, the abbot was willing to pass on all of his knowledge of traditional medicine. But John Fuhrman couldn't see himself living that life. And for a long time, as a temple boy, he wasn't really listening that much to the Dharma talks. But as he got older, he began to listen to them and started reflecting on himself. Here he was, in a really bad position in the society. Not much hope. He figured, I've got to make a lot of merit. I've got to do whatever it requires to make merit, to build goodness inside. And so even though things from the outside didn't look all that hopeful, he ended up becoming one of the great Achans, because he had the determination not to let circumstances get him down, and not to be blocked by his mistakes. We're all going to make mistakes as we practice. The difference lies in these two qualities, one, of not letting them get you down, being able to maintain good humor in spite of your mistakes, and then two, knowing how to learn from your mistakes. When the Buddha was teaching Rahula. He didn't just say, don't make mistakes. He said, if you make a mistake, this is what you do. When you look at the results of your actions while you're doing the action, because sometimes the results will come right away. You stick your finger in a fire and you don't have to wait until the next lifetime to, to feel the pain. It's immediate. So if you catch yourself doing something in the meditation that's getting bad results, it will stop. If you don't see any bad results, just stick with it. But if over the long term there are some bad results that appear, then you talk it over with somebody. And then you resolve not to repeat that mistake. Notice you don't beat yourself up over it. You develop a healthy sense of shame, which is the, not the opposite of pride. It's the opposite of shamelessness. You realize, okay, that was a mistake. I don't want to repeat it. And I'm determined not to repeat it, and I'm confident that I will be able not to repeat it. That's the attitude you've got to take. And when you do something well, okay, pat yourself on the back. Take joy in the fact that you are making progress, because that joy is part of the good humor that we're talking about. You begin to say, oh yeah, there are some things that I can do well, so that the mistakes don't totally wipe you out. If you're afraid to notice the things you're doing well, then where are you going to get the good spirit you need in order to keep with us? Because it is a long-term practice. You don't meditate just for a couple weeks and then get all the benefits of the meditation. It's something that's going to take a lifetime. Even those who've gained awakening, they continue to meditate afterwards because it's a pleasant abiding for the mind at that point. So this is a place where you're going to stay. So you want to stay on good terms with it.
pace yourself so that your efforts don't totally wear you out, and particularly so they don't wear out your good humor. Push yourself enough, since you are learning more. After all, the Buddha said this is a path that leads to the realization of things we've never realized before, to attain things we've never attained before. And so what it means is doing things we've never done before. So of course there are going to be mistakes as you feel your way. But when you learn from your mistakes, then the Dharma becomes yours. You may know about things you've learned in the past and things you've heard other people say. But it really becomes your Dharma when you notice, okay, I did this and these were the results I got, and I did that and those were the results I got then. And I figured out which is better, which is to be developed and which is to be avoided. Because I've seen it. That's what you tell yourself. That's how the Dharma becomes your own. And that's how your mind becomes Dharma. So bring the right attitude, the expectation that there will be mistakes, but you can learn from them. You can see them. Eventually you learn how to see them coming so you can avoid them. That's because you've fell, fallen into the holes, fallen into those mistakes enough times, so you recognize the warning signals. This is how we all learn. This is how the Buddha learned. This is how all the great disciples and all the Ajahns, how everybody who meditates has to learn. But if you bring the right attitude toward your mistakes, they actually become part of the path. <laughs>